will start. All right, hello everyone. Good afternoon and thanks a lot for joining us. My name is Joseph Ram. I'm the deputy country manager for Stashway Mina. And uh, I'm actually quite excited about today's session, uh, which is part of our uh, new series that we, uh, we created called the Stash Away Money Chat series, where every single month we'll be bringing leaders in the industry to discuss uh, multiple topics about you know, different kind of uh, financial uh, related uh, topics uh, and today's session about real estate in, uh, in particular. I'll be introducing our speakers in, uh, in a bit, but please, uh, if you guys have any kind of questions, please feel free to um, uh, add it in the Q&A box and we're also live on Facebook so if you have so for all of our Facebook viewers if you have any questions also you can drop it in the comment section on on uh, on Facebook all right uh, so again thanks a lot for joining and we have today uh, our speakers uh, without uh, I don't well Ramita Barra co-founder of Stake the digital real estate uh, man, uh, investment platform Rami, thanks a lot for joining us today. Really excited to have you on uh, on the chat. Thanks a lot, Joseph. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rami. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself and stake uh, for the viewers? Uh, you, for you, you've uh, you've been on the platform for the first time, so. Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, my name is Rami. I've been in Dubai for the last sixteen years. I've uh, been part of the real estate market since 2006. Uh, and yes, yeah, Stake was uh, founded with myself and my co founder, Manar, uh, close to a year and a half ago, is when we got together and started uh, putting the idea, getting the license uh, approved by the DFSA. Uh, and we launched January of this year, 2021. Um, Stake is an online digital investment platform that allows uh, people to invest in real estate uh, transparently uh, in under three minutes. Uh, we focus on ready real estate and allow people to earn income um, for as low as $500. Thanks, Nomi, appreciate it. And we'll deep dive more into stake in, in just a bit. Uh, but I also would like to introduce uh, Ramzi Ikhlef, General Manager of Stashway Mina. Thanks a lot, Rami, for uh, Ramzi, sorry for, for joining. Ramzi, Rami, it's going to be a bit confusing, by the way. <laughs> it happens a lot, actually. People uh, in the emails and things, they say they say Rami a lot. They call me Rami. Um, I think Rami maybe is a little bit more common than Ramzi, so, uh, but we'll make it work. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Ramzi, for joining. Also, would you mind introducing yourself and, and staff away? You've obviously been on, on, uh, on the platform for, for, well, from the launch, but for the new viewers. Yeah, so for those of you who haven't joined us before, my name is Ramzi Khleif. I'm the general manager for Stashway. I have um, over a decade's experience uh, predominantly in the region, starting off in kind of finance, private equity, uh, post-MBA, getting into management consulting, uh, specifically strategy consulting uh, with Booz & Company. Uh, and then I got into the kind of tech startup-ish kind of space, working with Kareem, uh, the ride hailing application for uh, a few years, starting off in their strategy team, ending as head of corporate for the region. Uh, and then after the Uber acquisition, uh, joined Stashway to uh, launch and then lead um, the operations for the MENA region. Uh, so kind of similar to Rami dealing with the regulations and the licensing and all the fun stuff involved in kind of getting your business started. Um, <laughs> so maybe just a quick intro on Stashway. So Stashway is a digital wealth manager or what's more commonly known as a robo advisor. So we take a digital first approach to managing your uh, your wealth or managing your investments. And it's specifically a risk-based approach. So based on your um, the risk level that's appropriate for you, which we assess based on kind of uh, your personal situation. So your income, marital status, uh, family size, et cetera, um, your individual risk tolerance, which we also assess, and then your uh, financial goals. So whether it's retirement, saving for a house, saving to uh, start your own business, uh, whatever that may be, we recommend a risk profile for you. And that's tied to a predetermined portfolio that we've created that includes a number of asset globally diversified asset classes, including bonds, equities, real estate, and uh, commodities. And so today's focus will be on real estate, of course. Thanks, Ramzi. Appreciate it. Um, all right. So, so just before I don't know, deep diving into the real estate market in general, and, and more specifically about the UAE, uh, Rami, uh, so you launch stake also with uh, with your co-founder Manar uh, as you said about a year and a half ago and you also also raised a series a funding not so long uh, not so long back so first of all congratulations on this 
Um, so thank you. Is our seed round actually? Sorry, oh, it was a seed round. Sorry. Okay. It was our, and, yeah, yeah. It was our seed round. Yeah. yeah. So congratulations no for, for this. Thank you. Really looking forward to, to, to seeing uh, steak uh, going above and beyond in, in that industry. Um, but uh, my question for you: So, you launched steak in the, the midst of one of the biggest global financial market crises that happened back in 2020. Uh, you know, obviously, the COVID uh, COVID crash. So, why did you pick that timing, in, in particularly? And two, what's the gap? So, you've been in the market, in the real estate market, for more about 15 years now. And so, what's the gap that you've seen in the market also that triggered you to launch Steak with your co-founder? Uh, so, I'll start off with that question first. And you know, I think being in the market for so long, you know, as you mentioned, it's closer to 16 years now. Um, and I've worked for some of the top developers in Dubai. Is working with you know seeing where the gaps are with with just how much money comes into Dubai. You know this year we're on pace to hitting 100 billion dirhams worth of money invested. I mean we're already crossed 60 billion dirhams of money poured into the real estate market here. So, you know over the years I've seen how much inefficiencies there are in the market. Um, it's particularly with retail investors who come in, uh, putting money into the market here and there's no transparency. So, you know there's a lot of people that uh, there is misalignment brokers and developers or some of the brokers and developers were, were selling product with uh, returns that didn't make sense uh, to investors. And I, you know, I would see that firsthand uh, and they would end up, you know, investors would put in their life savings or their, their, their children's college funds into properties with the, with the hopes uh, or the promises of, of getting returns um, that they never did. And most of the money at the time was going into off plan. So people were putting money into uh, products that weren't built. So they're paying across four or five years, we're seeing no returns and, you know, that, 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 that didn't make sense. Um, and then, you know, throughout the years dealing with retail investors, I sat down with so many investors who couldn't afford to buy real estate. Um, you know, they wanted to, to participate in this asset class uh, and they just, you know, couldn't either get a mortgage uh, or didn't have the means to put down a big down payment. And if you look at the market here, the majority of the investors are non-resident and getting a mortgage as a non-resident is even harder than than you know, getting, getting one as a resident. So, you know, I saw a big gap of, of people that, that just couldn't get onto the property ladder. Um, so, you know, transparency and affordability were two things that were like, okay, listen, if we can tap into this, um, then, you know, there's a market there. And as I mentioned, it's, it's already a, a huge market here. And then, you know, to answer your first question, which was on, on Corona and, and COVID and launching this during COVID is, you know, it, it happened. Manad and I, we, we decided to, to start this business way before, you know, the pandemic happened. Um, I actually left my job in the middle of the pandemic because, you know, I realized that now is the time to do this. And I actually think COVID helped us a lot. Um, you know, if you look at the world right now, there's historic levels of people buying real estate. You know, in the U.S., there's a, a, there's a shortage of 5 million houses. Uh, in Dubai right now, as I mentioned, the market's going crazy. If COVID helped real estate. And I think, you know, uh, residential real estate is more important than it ever was. You know, people are working from home a lot more than, than they used to. It's a lot more acceptable. Um, and people throughout whatever happened in COVID, rent still had to be paid. So actually COVID helped us a lot. And I'll add to that, that people are a lot more comfortable doing things online, right? Because of COVID. So, you know, and, and investing, whether it's, you know, through on Stashway or, or on stake, you know, people are a lot more comfortable doing things online. So, you know, that really helped us uh, and, and pushed us to, to, you know, say, listen, now is the time to do it. And, and, you know, thankfully we actually went to business this year in January and we've seen fantastic results. Absolutely, thank you. And, and you're absolutely right on the fact that uh, a lot of people are, you know, working now from home. Home is basically the main uh, office for, for everybody. So might as well invest in, in, a, in a real one uh, or a, a decent and proper one uh, for, for the long run. So absolutely. And we, we will go uh, deeper into, into that topic uh, in just a bit. Uh, but Ramzi, you know, uh, here in Stashaway, we really, you know, uh, preach a lot about diversification of your portfolio and within Stashaway, uh, you can invest obviously using ETFs, you can invest in the equity market, uh, the bond, the commodity, and obviously on the real estate front. But my question to you is how important is that real estate asset class to invest in and assume that someone doesn't invest in real estate, what's the opportunity cost here? So why is that asset class so important to have in a well-diversified portfolio? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to invest in real estate. Um, and it is, regardless of the method that you choose to invest in it, and we'll talk about those, I think, in a bit, but 
it, it is a hugely important asset class to have in your portfolio. So um, whether it's kind of owning your own home or owning it for investment purposes, um, that choice also kind of will change your change your reasoning and change your allocation. But it's massively important because uh, the important thing about a diversified portfolio is that not everything is supposed. It, it depends on your risk level. So if you're only investing in real estate, that's probably something that you should not be doing, and all of your wealth is tied up in that. Versus all of your wealth is tied up in in equities. That's also something that you should not be doing. You need to have. Uh, depending on, so similar, so like what I was talking about earlier, depending on your risk tolerance, that'll determine what the asset allocation would look like. But in most kind of situations, you should have some real estate exposure, um, whether it is your, your own home or it is um, an investment that you do hold. And so that percentage allocation will be different based on your individual risk tolerance, based on your in the portfolio that makes sense for you. And that's determined by kind of tools like Sashway and other wealth managers um, that kind of based on your situation, based on your risk tolerance, then we recommend an optimum portfolio uh, that maximizes the potential returns at each uh, at each given risk level. And so real estate is a big important part of that because it adds to that correlation. So not all asset classes are supposed to move up together. Not all asset classes are supposed to move down together. Otherwise, that defeats the purpose of diversification. So depending on the macro environment and the economic environment we, which we are in, Sometimes things will move up, sometimes things will move down, but what's most important is how they move together as a basket um, based on kind of what's going on in the situation. And so, like we said, we saw the crash happening, which Rami was talking about. COVID overall was very good for real estate, but it also depends when you got into real estate. So if you bought just before the crash, maybe not so much, but uh, afterwards it created a massive opportunity. There was a big glut uh, and then people started driving, kind of coming in, and uh, if we look at some of the data, it's uh, it's also quite interesting because you have uh, it's it's reached kind of almost record lows over the last uh, the last two years ago uh, compared to kind of like over the last ten years, uh, not quite. But then it shows that you have a massive potential for for upside as well. Thank you, Rami. Do you want to put your or give your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I you know I, I'm a strong believer of. Uh, you know, and I'm speaking very objectively here. You know, we, we represent real estate, and we believe we believe in, in real estate as an asset class. But I, you know, I, I believe in the 20% rule. At least 20% of, of your portfolio should be in, in uh, alternative assets, specifically real estate. Um, you know, and, and I've I've been a big believer of it ever since I was young. I've been buying real estate, and you know, I think uh, it's definitely a, a great asset to have. Um, you know, and and but I, I also strongly believe in diversification. You know, you shouldn't be putting everything into one one asset class so you know i think uh, the 20 percent rule is, is is what what i believe in or and and i think that you know having a very well diversified portfolio is the key to, to success and making sure that you know you, you're creating a, a very well balanced portfolio interesting um and i want to take a bit step back and uh you know discuss about the real estate market in general and more specifically about the uae one uh, and Ramzi, you did mention in your explanation that uh, we've seen a lot of ups and downs in the, the UAE market. And uh, actually, it's been a roller coaster uh, over the last two decades. If I can if I see the stats in front of me, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the real estate the property price index actually peaked at, in 2008, and then it crashed just after the, the financial market crisis uh, that happened in 2008. And then in 2011, it picked up again all the way to 2014. And in 2014, it dropped back to 2020, just after the COVID crash. And now we're seeing an upward trend again. So it's really been a, a, a roller coaster of uh, going up, up and down. And, and my question for you, Rami, is in 2014, what actually happened for the market to, you know, to take this much of a hit all the way to 2020? So six years of downfall in the prices of the market, while the SP 500 or even other proper or, or real estate markets were performing quite well uh, across the, the globe. But here, more specifically in the UAE, it was dropping a lot. So what was the reason for that? Uh, that's uh, number one. And number two, uh, what was the reason for its upward trend right now? So a lot of people are buying a lot of villas, a lot of apartments in, around Dubai yeah. and the UAE, and people are still riding the wave just for, just for now. So it's not a small period. So it's actually growing. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, you know, people tend to 
I know that in 2014, you know, the, 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 the market started to cool down and, and, you know, the numbers started dropping, but again, you know, even in, in 2020 and, and 2019, you're seeing 20 to 25 billion dollars worth of transactions, which is still considerable. Uh, but, you know, I think people get, uh, like to, you know, I think Dubai real estate is a topic that people love to discuss. It's everyone talks about it. They love to hate it. Some people love to hate on it. Some people try to, you know, uh, 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 you know, overblow what, what's going on and over exaggerate what's going on. But, no, I think what the, the major reason was oversupply. Um, you know, I think when 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 the financial crisis happened that you mentioned in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, um, you know, it, it kind of slowed down the market. Uh, and then it's, when it started picking up, a lot of developers just started building uh, anything. Uh, and, and, and you know, as long as they were selling on a brochure, you know, people were standing in line and, and buying property. As long as they were selling, um, they kept on building. So you know, one of them was obviously uh, oversupply and and developments that were being built that didn't make sense. And that obviously uh, led to an imbalance uh, between supply and demand. And then you also had political instability. Uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, regional issues. Um, you had the price of oil dropping. Uh, so, you know, those are the three, the three main things. And I think, you know, after, as we got closer to right before COVID, you know, in 2019, Zaina Sheikh Mohammed introduced the hiring committee for supply uh, to ensure that there's a control and, and, and sitting down with, with developers to make sure that the, the developments that they introduce are, are, are ones that make sense uh, and of value. So that obviously was a huge positive sentiment to the market. Um, and it's, you know, considerably, it's, it's added a lot of kind of not, not a watchdog, but it's added a lot of uh, checks and balances to what developers are going to release. Uh, but then, you know, the way Dubai, you know, after uh, to answer your question as well, is, you know, that's what happened in 2014 that caused the slowdown. What happened then to, to get the market to pick up again is, you know, COVID was a blessing in disguise uh, for Dubai. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's when you, when you say that to people, they're like, yeah, but you know, all over the world, it's been an economic slowdown. I think it's, it's one of the best things that's happened to Dubai uh, and Dubai tends to thrive on, 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 on chaos around the world. You know, a lot of money comes into Dubai and I think the way they reacted to COVID was fantastic. Um, you know, they were one of the first cities to open up, uh, uh you know, vaccinations. And I think, you know, it, if you were locked up in anywhere in the world, where else would you go? And Dubai was really advertising as, as an open city. So a lot of people realized, hey, listen, I want to come to Dubai. They saw how, how amazing the city is, the value for money that you get. Uh, it was amazing. And, and I think a lot of money started coming in where, where people were realizing, you know, listen, taxes and, 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 and uh, uh, COVID lockdowns, why not come to Dubai? And I also think what COVID did as well is it shook the developers and they, they stopped building. So that shrunk the supply, which was also you know, huge, uh, a huge beneficial thing for the market. Um, and then finally as well, all the, all the things that they've introduced, you know, the golden visa, long-term visas, uh, the 10-year visas, the five-year visas, the retirement visas. I think if you look at what's going on right now is people who, who are coming here thinking, oh, listen, I'll come to Dubai for two or three years. And now we're saying, listen, this is a home. Uh, I, I, I want to be here. This is a place for my family and kids. Uh, it's very safe. And, and, and you see that right now. I was reading an article yesterday that 83% of the people who've taken mortgages uh, so far in 2021 and up to 2020 uh, are buying uh, are for homes for, for living in, not investment. So you're seeing a big trend of the market right shift, now. Exactly. Where even off. Yeah, there's a huge shift and, and, and there's a huge shift into uh, the secondary market, which means people are buying ready homes to move into. So, you know, and, and I really see this trend uh, uh, continuing. I see this as, as, as a place, you know, do, do, the, the pandemic is still there and, and, and you look at all these places that are closing and they're not getting vaccinated and they're thinking about a third a lockdown after a third wave and Dubai has really established itself. So, you know, I really see that the, the, all of this is going to be positive for the market and it's not just a short term thing. I, I really see this run uh, going for, for, for a while. Absolutely. And, and, and for you, Ramsey, you've been living here in the UAE for for quite some some time, so we've seen Dubai being built from scratch, basically. Okay. Yeah. So not to disclose how old I am, but uh, I've been here on and off the uh, first time since 1993. Obviously, I was very young back then. It was part of my like parents' work, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. So I saw there was when it Sheikh Zayed Road was like it was a road. That's why it's called Sheikh Zayed Road. It was it wasn't a highway um, back then, and the trade center was the tallest building and basically the only kind of high rise. Uh, and then you saw the development of Marina and the digging of it. And now it's just, 
this uh, ginormous sprawling city, which is fantastic. And so to benefit from it uh, and be here and see that is, is a great experience. But uh, to go to your questions, it's so just like most asset classes, there is an element of cyclicality, right? So not everything kind of goes up in a linear line forever without any kind of uh, fluctuations and corrections. And so this uh, real estate is no different and it's part of that. So it shouldn't deter you from investing or wanting to invest um, in it. It all comes back to also your uh, what your purpose is and what you want to achieve in it. And so the market here is starting to mature and is uh, developed a lot uh, specifically the real estate market uh, since it first started when off-plan sales started in uh, like the early 2000s. So over the last 20 years, it's it's really come a long way. And now, like Rami was saying, with all these additional visas, with people buying more long-term, with the mortgage now shifting to end users. So end users bring more stability because it's no longer, or not no longer, it's becoming less so a speculative asset. And so that's where it makes even more sense to have it as part of your portfolio. So it's not something that has it, it going forward, it shouldn't have as large a volatility as it used to have. Of course, volatility is part of every asset class and that's why you diversify. Um, but so it's uh, it's an ever evolving, uh, ever evolving thing. Exactly. And yeah, you mentioned that Shazai wrote this rule because it was like a straight line and there's a desert uh, on, on its left and on its right. Um, but again, Dubai and especially the UAE have you know, uh, was developed uh, over the years. And we've seen multiple regions, you know, shifting from the hub, uh, you know, to new hubs. And we're gonna probably be seeing that uh, over the, the long run. You know, Sharjah was one of the best, uh, you know, kind of city. It was very well developed uh, back in the days. It still is uh, at the moment, but you know, people were 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 still uh, were going to Sharjah to to live. And then here in the UAE, Dera started being developed quite well. And then Marina, downtown, GIFC. So according to you, uh, Rami what would be uh, the region in the UAE uh, to invest in at the moment? So, and maybe also five or 10 years down the line. You know, part of our, our ethos and, and mission and what we drive on always at, at stake is we only go for prime locations. Um, and I think we've seen time and time again that when the market drops uh, and then picks up again, it always picks up at, in, in the prime locations. And I think, you know, uh, when you look at the market today, yes, there's new areas being built and, you know, Dubai South and where the new airport's going to be. But I think the main areas or the established areas that you have, such as downtown Dubai, such as DIFC, uh, Palm Jumeirah, Dubai Marina, I think those are the locations which I would always, you know, invest in. And you see, there's an article that came out yesterday with Property Finder saying that the rents uh, in downtown and Dubai Marina have started picking up. Um, so I would definitely focus on, on, on those prime areas. Uh, and, and, you know, where I see in the next, where the next uh, areas to be, where to, to look at investing is there's the, the Dubai Creek, which is a very interesting development. I don't know if you've been down there. And if you haven't, I think it's definitely worth a drive. It Dubai is Creek is, is uh, you know, it's beautifully done. And I think that's somewhere in the future that to keep an eye on. Um, and then all the developments are happening on the Jumeirah coast uh, where, you know, La Mer and, and where developers like uh, Dubai Holding, uh, where else have built. You know, beautiful waterfront properties all the way, you know, even Bulgari and uh, uh, Jumeirah Island, Jumeirah Bay, obviously, you know, there's different price ranges, but anything that's close to the water that, that they're building right now is, is fantastic. But again, Prime, uh, we're big believers of Prime, you know, uh, capital preservation, capital appreciation, you know, uh, vacancy risk is a lot less in, in, in Prime areas like the ones I mentioned. Yeah, and then so unlike any other, unlike other asset classes, it's Location, location, location. That's like really the most important thing in, in real estate in general, especially if you want stability, kind of long-term returns, and you want it to be an investment as opposed to just where you live and where you're going to spend um, X number of years kind of in. Even there, even then you want it to, to make sense for you, but uh, as, an, as, as an investment uh, for investment purposes, that's uh, the location is more important. And um, you can do any way you choose to invest in real estate, that becomes a kind of a, a key component. Okay. So how much more can you actually build in, in the UAE, right? So you've said uh, that a lot of developers did stop their, their projects during during COVID, but they're starting to pick up again. Like I, I, I was sharing with you just before our call that I live in Marina and right across my home, there is a new Marina being built right now just across the palm. So uh, first of all, they're going to block my view. That's a shame. And and two, I mean, <laughs> who's, who's going to be living there? That's, that's like, for me, 
buildings are literally being constructed on a yearly basis or even like a monthly basis here and they go like mushroom crazy and and more specifically, for example, Expo 2020, a big, big project being built uh, in the UAE. And it's amazing to the government, to, 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 the, to, to the economy. Uh, a lot of people will be coming here uh, during uh, between October and, and April to, to enjoy uh, that huge event. But what's going to happen to to the Expo after the Expo? And what's going to happen to, to these uh, complexes after these big events? Is it sustainable enough? Uh, you're asking me to start? Yeah, or, yeah. Or I'm, you... as, I'm asking you as, as so you're, you're putting me on you're the, the spot for you're, you're, you're the real estate expert, Ronnie. I, <laughs> I, I got carried away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that's, listen, it's a great question. And it's a question that's on everyone's mind. And, you know, I, I always get asked that uh, even when I was working at, at the Mac and, 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 or, or First Group and from all the investors saying, yeah, listen, you, you, you're selling Expo, but what happens after Expo? And I think, you know, there's, there's one thing that... Uh, you know, Dubai is always good at is they have a lot of uh, uh, things that they still haven't announced yet, right? And there's many talks about, you know, uh, they just announced UAE citizenship, right? And that's something that they're already giving out to, to certain uh, uh, people, uh, which they can open up. And I think you know, there's a lot of tricks they can take, get out of, of the hat. You know, they have a lot of cards that they still have to play that they'll bring in. And, and again, you know, you, everyone talks about, yeah, but I look at the buildings and they're empty, you know, and I say, okay, how's that possible? So, you know, I live in City Walk. Uh, you know, when I, when I moved in two years ago, I'm like, okay, listen, this is deserted. I'm the only one. And now my building is full. And I say to myself, you know, there's people coming in and there's, there's a lot more people now coming in from COVID. And you just need to believe in the fact that, listen, where, with COVID happening and people being able to work a lot more remotely, do we, do we believe that the future of Dubai and all this, uh, uh, you know, a supply that's coming online, will it be filled by people coming from around the world saying, listen, this is a place I want to be, whether it's to work uh, remotely or to live in. And, you know, again, it, the, the beauty of Dubai is it caters to so many people around the world, um, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in Asia, whether you're in the US, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And when you look at all the supply that's coming online, can you, is there enough demand that you can get from these feeder markets in Asia, for example? And the answer is yes. Can you get enough uh, so demand from, from feeder markets like in, in, in Africa, uh, in Europe right now. I mean, this year, if you look at the top 10 nationalities, it's no longer, it's switched. You have a lot of European countries that are coming in. France is now top three. And there's a lot more people that are saying, listen, I want to come here. So, you know, if, if, and, and, and again, where can you buy? You mentioned in front of you, I know which one you're talking about. You're talking about the beachfront, Amara beachfront, which I know mm -hmm. very well. It's a fantastic product. It's beautiful. It reminds me of Miami. Uh, uh, where can you buy a, an apartment that overlooks the sea for $500,000 anywhere in the world of that quality? You can't. I mean, it, it'll take you a while to, to find that. And I think, you know, yes, there's going to be a lot more supply coming on, but I think, you know, there's going to be, uh, they, they'll always find a way to get the demand. To answer your question on Expo, uh, I've heard many things that they're going to, they're going to keep it as a, a, a continuous uh, a center where people could come in and explore different uh, histories about different countries that are exhibiting there. Uh, there's going to be the airport, you know, the biggest airport in the world right there. So that's going to bring in a lot more attraction. I mean, you look at Dubai South today, they've built buildings, they go there, the occupancy is around 60%. And that's still not, the whole area hasn't even developed it. So, you know, I, I, I don't worry about Dubai finding a way to generate demand. I mean, this city caters to so many people around the world. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something to, to I'm, I'm confident about it. Well, I really hope so, honestly, because... Uh... I don't want the, the buildings to ruin uh, the great view that I have, so <laughs> might as well. <laughs> Being, uh, yeah, but no. So cool. it's it's funny because it's so at the end of the day, it's location, but it's also value for money. So as long as you're in a quality development where you're the what you're getting in return for what you're paying makes sense, and the location makes sense for you, um, it may, you know, so it, then uh, you're gonna have demand kind of coming in. So you need, of course, with continued expansion, you need an influx of people and they're, the government, I'm sure, are doing uh, different things to, to ensure that kind of flow continues because they are investing heavily in, uh, in the infrastructure, but it's no longer a build it and they will come. Now it needs to make a lot more sense. And so what Rami was saying earlier about uh, the committee that's supposed to control the oversupply and make sure that thing, the projects that are coming online are aligned with kind of the vision and uh, uh, these kind of things. So it's, it all kind of comes back to the fundamentals of supply and demand. So if you're building something that doesn't make sense, prices are going to go down until that equilibrium happens. If you're building that something that does make sense and the value proposition is, uh, is there, then people are going to keep coming. 
And so you all you also have a mix of investment purpose and uh, end user purpose. And so those are also two different kind of groups um, that you have. And now you have even vacations home coming becoming a, a larger part. And now with the remote working just becoming more popular globally and the remote work visa that they've issued here. So people are starting to be able to come spend the year here, um, get an affordable visa and then contribute to the economy, rent out, rent the apartments, um, et cetera. 100%. Yeah. I'll, I'll also I'll add to that as well. So sorry, to, 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 there's one thing that that's very important to note is when you look at the yields that you can make in Dubai real estate. I mean, right now you, 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 the rents have dropped, um, and you still can comfortably make anywhere between four to seven percent net um, on property here on residential. I mean, where can you do that? Well, tax free, right? So when, yeah. when you look at that, it's you know from an, as, to go back to your point, as we're talking about from an investment point of view. Uh, you know, end user, we talked about the benefits of living in Dubai and the value for money and everything here. But again, when you look at, um, you know, the benefits of, of actually as an investor and the yields that you can make here, they're phenomenal. Um, and they're unnatural for, for a city like that. So value for money and return on investment is actually very good. Here. Interesting. Thanks a lot uh, for, for your input on this. And um, I want to bring back that article that you mentioned, you know, that came out yesterday where uh, the the uh, rent prices are increasing by some people some even uh, owners are are asking for you know ten percent uh, increase in, in rent for, for for the new cycle and that, that for me is is crazy uh, but it begs the question is does it make sense for now someone to to rent an apartment or is it is he better off you know putting that down payment and purchase his, his own home and this is why I want we we want to answer together that main event question of, of today is it is better buying or renting uh, an apartment and it doesn't matter if it's in the UAE or outside of the UAE we do have some uh, members of the audience that are not uh, in the UAE but for in in, in the, as an overall kind of answer um, this is what we'll be tackling today so uh, Ramzi um, maybe before digging deeper into, into that question what would be your top three tips for someone that is you know uh, lost into that uh, that big question so yes yeah, so there's a number of things that kind of go into deciding whether you should buy or rent so buying doesn't necessarily make sense for everyone so first off um, there's a certain time frame that you need to be considered to kind of live in your house so if you're only going to be here for a year or two then the the costs involved will probably make that not worthwhile so you should continue to rent if uh, you're kind of uh, family and things are going to be, your size is going to be evolving. You're expecting to grow and you can't afford uh, that home that you need for that, whether it's in kind of one, two, three years, then again, maybe you should hold off. But the biggest thing is you need that down payment uh, and it's in, plus the other costs, which uh, a lot of people forget to consider. So uh, it's not just that 20%. It's also the, uh, uh, the, 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 the land registration fee. It's the agent fee it's your mortgage fees, it's the interest you're going to pay on your mortgage, it's the, uh, the appraisal cost. Uh, and then even after ownership, you have your annual maintenance contract, you have the service charges. So there's a lot of other things that go into it beyond just kind of that purchase price or that just that down payment that people tend to tend to forget about. So that's, our, that's the biggest component. So your timeline um, and your ability to kind of meet those payments or meet those cost obligations these are the two biggest things that uh, that go into it. And then the third piece, which a lot of people tend to forget, and this applies kind of across all asset classes and comes back to our philosophy of risk-based investing. So psychologically, are you comfortable kind of doing that? Is having a 20 or 30 year mortgage, is that going to weigh on you a lot? Um, are you kind of, if, if you don't have job security and you're worried about making your next mortgage payment, um, that's something to, to kind of consider. So it's also the psychological factor of it as well. Or is owning a home going to give you that peace of mind in the long run? And whether it makes financial sense or not for you, it gives you that, that psychological or, or mental peace of mind, which is also very difficult to calculate, right? So the numbers are very important, but it's also more than the numbers, especially when it comes to home, which can be sometimes an emotional decision. Absolutely. And, and we did also release a, a poll in the... Uh, in the... Uh, in the Zoom. So if you guys have an opinion, would you rather buy or rent? Please feel free to, to, to give your opinion on that. Um, and, and Rami, um, I, want, I want also your opinion on this uh, uh, later on, but uh, 
tell me, uh, if when someone purchases a home, like if when someone is actually in the process of buying a home, uh, it's not only the down payment that you will be putting uh, aside. So there's a lot of cost to it that comes. That so I won't say hidden cost, but uh, people don't actually consider them part of you know their their budget. So what are these costs? Uh, first of all, and what are the other things that you should be looking out for while choosing and purchasing a, a, a property? Not necessarily a home, but any, any kind of property. No, the main costs are, you know, transaction costs that uh, Nancy was just touching on. You know, you have to pay a, a commission. Uh, there's uh, if you're buy buying it through a, a, a bank, where you're getting a mortgage. Then you, you obviously there's mortgage fees. You also uh, uh, need to pay the valuation fees. Uh, you know, and, and those are just the setup fees. And then you need to pay your 4% DLD, which is, uh, you know, paid to, the, to buy land department uh, to register and get the title deed. So, you know, all those kind of stack up in the beginning. Um, and then on the long term, obviously, you have the uh, maintenance charges. Uh, but, you know, if, for me, it's when you're buying a home, uh, you know, Ramsey mentioned something, which is it's, it's more of an emotional decision, right? You're, you're, you're buying your home. It's just something that you think about, okay, uh, you, you, might, you might care more about the view, you might care more about the size, you might care more about the location stuff. So, you know, it's more, of an, it's more of an emotional decision, but I also think, you know, some people tend to think when I buy my home, it's not an investment. I kind of disagree. I think, you know, buying uh, your home isn't an investment. Um, and and for, for a number of reasons, which we, which we can get into. Um, but, you know, I, I think right now, even when you, when you look at it, and right now, and, and if, if COVID taught us anything, is your home is very important. Um, and I think with rents increasing, um, you, you're going to have to look at, and, and with prices increasing, you're going to have to say, if I don't buy now, when am I going to buy? And I think right now is a fantastic time to, to get on the property ladder. Interest rates are, are, are his, his, at a historical low, um, you know, and, and a lot of people are getting it. And that's why you're seeing transactions are, are, are going and ref, a lot of people are refinancing. So, you know, the people are saying, listen, now is a great time to buy. And I think buying a home allows you to preserve capital, build equity, uh, saves you from buying from paying rent and when when rent is increasing it makes sense to buy home because you know that that you're going to be paying that and that's money just down the drain and i think you know a lot of people say yeah but i'm paying rent that frees up my capital if i'm if i don't own a home that frees up capital to do something else but people tend to say that but what is that something else you know do you have access to that something else do you have the time to manage that um and i think you know people and you have access you know a lot of accessibility to, to investment is, 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 isn't that easy and straightforward, which is what you guys are beautifully doing. You know, you're opening up the access and making it easier for people to participate in, in other things. So, you know, and, and it also uh, you're not asked in Dubai, uh, specifically, this is a Dubai issue, at least one or two, every one or two years, you're asked your landlord because it's an investment market. Landlord says, oh, I want to sell it. Uh, and then you have to move and all that money that you paid on furnishing and then any fixtures. Yeah, moving costs also, so, you need to move, you need to, you need curtains, uh, you need to do the deep cleaning, exactly. the pest control. Uh... <laughs> exactly. 100%. And, 100%. And, and I think, you know, it... sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please, please. No, I was just saying, as well as in our part of the world, there's an affinity to buying real estate, you know, and, and people say that it builds. We we're taught from when, you, when we were young, at least my age, uh, you know, it builds generational wealth. They, you know, you buy a home. The first thing you should do is buy a home, and, and we, you know, at stake we agree, and it's part of our mission to to, to make owning real estate a lot more easier. Uh, you know, and, and introducing fractional investment allows opens up to a lot more people. And you know, part of our roadmap is is doing a lot of things to make sure to, to make home ownership a lot easier as well. I do want to talk about uh, you know fractional investing in a bit, but I can see from the audience that there is a big split between you know buying versus renting. Actually, more than seventy percent of the attendees today would rather buy than rent. But for just a couple of minutes, I want to play the devil's advocate uh, on the renting part um, because everybody has been praising the buying part. But all right, assume that you have that down payment sitting ready to, to put uh, in order for you to get your, your mortgage. And then what about you actually invest that down payment into the SP500, for example, and generating returns uh, on that on a, on a yearly basis? Uh, so what would you say for, for someone who, who would think like this? Uh, obviously, it's, it's not the wrong way to think, uh, but what would be your co counter argument for someone to put his down payment into an investment fund rather than actually buying the property? So, 
transition. Yeah, so it's it so that's what the opportunity cost is, right? So that's how you should be thinking about that. So let's say I have just for easy numbers, I have a hundred. Um, is that I'm going to put it to my house, um, or am I going to invest that in the S and P 500? Obviously, depending on when you invested in S and P 500, uh, you probably would have made a lot more money than investing in real estate. But it comes back to the other factors um, that are involved. So does it make sense? It, it all comes back to, does it make sense for you? Is And we think of it in terms of kind of like the risk index or the risk tolerance. So it's it's not just, are you comfortable with that risk? It's, does this decision make the most sense for you? And the way you th should think about all of your spending, not just investing, is what is the opportunity cost? So if I save $1,000 a month on my rent, after 30 years, I have a million dollars. So what's, but if you invest, if, if you don't, if you only have a thousand dollars and you don't have that hundred uh, to purchase, then of course that decision is made for you. But if you have that hundred and you take it out and you put it in real estate, um, again, it, it serves different purposes. So you're buying your primary home um, is, is still an investment and it's arguably the biggest investment that majority of people are going to make um, for themselves. Um, but it's not, it's, shouldn't be considered part of your kind of investment portfolio because it's not an asset that you can easily um, sell and then buy back to, um, to, to benefit from these kind of price changes or increases in the market. So renting gives you that flexibility. If you're someone who's more opportunistic, if you love the risk, if you feel like uh, in if two or three years, I'm going to be making more money and then I want to upgrade. And then two or three more years, I'm going to make more money then I'm going to upgrade again. Uh, then, I mean, that's the argument for renting, right? If you're only going to be here two or three years, then you shouldn't buy, you should rent, maybe buy in your home country if that's where you plan on going back to. Um, so it's it's a lot of factors come involved. And then here, the other thing that is, applies to most markets is tax. Here, we don't really have that. So that's not a, that's not a consideration. Uh, but depending on where you're from and if you have to pay taxes in that country, uh, usually the mortgage payment or the interest portion of the mortgage payment is tax deductible. So that's another kind of complexity that comes into uh, calculating kind of the opportunity cost. But so if you look at it from a pure numbers, the situation is going to depend on each person, the area, the location, the building, the time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But once you add in that kind of other, the other factors or the non-tangibles, then uh, each person becomes like a little bit different. Thank, thanks. For that. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yep. Yeah, uh, and I do want to come back actually to the point that you made, Rami, on, on the fractional shares on investment that you can put in, within property. So assume that person doesn't have that uh, down payment to put uh, towards his property and he cannot afford to, to be invested in, in real estate. So what are the alternatives for him uh, that's available today in the market to be invested in the real estate market in general? So for us at stake, you know, Home home ownership, we, we want to make that easier, and that's definitely part of our roadmap. And you know, if we if if you do invite me to another webinar, we'll we'll, we'll discuss that uh, uh, as a part of a, a product we'll on our roadmap to. because it's something that we're very excited about. Right, right now, what stake does? <laughs> thank you. Right now, what stake does is uh, it really makes uh, uh, real estate investment easier for for investors, and it opens it up to to people who either one couldn't afford to invest in real estate um, or you know couldn't get a mortgage or whatever the reason was or just weren't comfortable in putting all that equity you know as you mentioned there's a there's a big outlay in the beginning whether it's a down payment uh, to put down or getting that mortgage to just weren't comfortable in putting all the equity into one asset class so you know, what stake does is it opens fractional investment and what it allows people to do is you come online you, you you're able to have the freedom of selection uh, we onboard you. you. You can invest in stake in under three minutes. Uh, you come on, enter, create, a, create an account, um, go through the onboarding process, which is a KYC process that we need to do because we're regulated by the DFSA. Uh, and on, in under three minutes, you can buy real estate. So we open it up. We give you the freedom to choose which property you want to invest in. Um, and then you can come in for as low as $500. So what, and what we end up doing is, let's say we select a unit in downtown, a one bedroom. For a million dirhams, uh, people can come in for as low as two thousand. Let's say someone comes in at at, at a hundred thousand, they own ten percent of that property, uh, and then once we close the, the 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 funding amount for that property, we register it uh, as an SPV, um, special purpose vehicle. It's a company in in the IFC, and then people get a share certificate uh, that equates to how much they own in that property, uh, and the title deed comes out in the land department uh, in the name of the SPV. 
And what we're seeing, I mean, it, it's, it, you know, I've sat down, as I mentioned, I've sat down with investors over the years who, who have loved to be part of this asset class and want to be part of this asset class. But the, the biggest hurdle in this is that it, it's, it's very capital intensive. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people say, okay, hey, listen, I, I'd love to, are, are scared of getting into the real estate uh, uh, investment or this asset class because of the fact that it, it entails a lot of capital to be, to be invested. So what Stake does is it opens up to, to, to people to come in for, a, for smaller shares. Um, and, and what we're seeing is people are, are, are loving to do this. They're doing it on a monthly basis now. So it's part of, what they're, they're part of their salary. They're putting aside and putting it into Stake because what we do is we get properties that are uh, rented um, so our investors are able to make returns on a monthly basis immediately. So as soon as the property is closed, we start paying dividends on a monthly basis. So it's, it's kind of a, a, the, the second income for, for people. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rami, for, for that intervention. And I want to be conscious of the time and leave it, uh, give a bit of time for Q&A, actually. Uh, so we'll jump right into it. To, to this. So first of all, thank you so much, Rami and Ramsey, for, for your inputs on, on that great discussion. And uh, I'll, uh, we definitely want you back on, uh, I'm going to call it the show, right? This is a podcast. Um, we want you back on the show, Rami. Uh, very, very soon. Uh, I look forward so, to it. <laughs> so we'll jump right into the question. Uh, all right, I think we have a question for you, uh, Rami, directed there to Stake. So how do Stake is, yes. uh, how do Stake help is helping in reducing the cost for retail investors to enter uh, into this asset class? Since there are four types of costs charged by the company, acquisition fee, 1.5%, yearly admission administration fee per investment value, that's 2.5%, uh, exist, uh, exit fee and exit incentive fee of 15%. Aside from the proper, uh, the normal property acquisition and maintenance costs. So, what would be your answer to that? So, you know, I'll, I'll say that you know, as a platform uh, operating uh, an investment platform that is regulated, there's a lot of costs that we have to to incur. Um, you know, to, to be able to sustain the business and actually operate under a regulated license. So, you know, I'll start off with the last question, which or the last fee that's talking about the incentive fee of fifteen percent. Actually, you know, this aligns us with our investors. So what ends up happening is if we sell, we're incentivized to sell the property at as much of a, a, a higher price as possible because that's when you know our, our biggest fee comes into play because we say okay listen, you know we have a property if it's only appreciated five or ten percent we want our, our our investors to say listen we want them to make the most money because if they make more money then then we do so you know this this fee is something that we we we've put to align ourselves with the investors, and if you go to any of, of uh, an asset manager who's managing. An investment on your behalf. There's always a success fee that's that's part of it. In terms of the running fees that, that are that are charged, you know, it's it's part of actually setting up the SPV where there's a lot of costs involved with that in, in the DIFC, um, and and we take care of all the headaches. So you know, when you look at uh, uh, the beauty of our platform, is it's hassle-free. So you know, we have people investing in Singapore, we have people investing in Malaysia, we have people investing in, in the US and in, in, in Canada. We're not we're not allowed to onboard people living in the US actually. Um, we have people from actually all, 54 different nationalities have invested with us. And the reason why they can do that is because it's hassle-free, they do it from their phone. So to be able to take care of all of that through uh, a third-party property management company, there's fees in, 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 in that, that are, you know, that we incur. Um, so part of this hassle-free experience and this digital experience and this regulated experience uh, has, uh, has fees that are involved. And, and that's why, you know, we've charged this. Now, in terms of, of, of accessibility you know we're giving investors the ability to get into real estate uh, that is below market price and, and and allowing them to do that fractionally um so you know that's that's where where the, the main uh, push from from stake is is listen you know for people who want to buy into fractional real estate and and want to buy into good deals uh, there's a lot of costs involved with that that come in from from putting them onto our platform from sourcing them to getting them uh, uh, ensure they're rented uh, uh, vacancy risk is low, so you know that's that's where where, where the fees are, where, where where you know where the costs are going. Thanks, thanks, Ram. Um, so we also have another question from uh, the attendee. It's, mm -hmm. it's less of a question, more of a statement. So I would like to buy, but not in Dubai, yes. given the true quality of the buildings. My building is ten years old and falls apart, and management takes the excuse that it's an old building. My house in my country is much older and in better quality. So. Uh, Actually, it does well. There is kind of a good point to to, to that statement that 
and I actually want your opinion on it. Uh, does the heat plays a big part in you know the, the 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 maintenance that you need to put towards the building and your home because I mean that kind of weather that we have here is not very similar to any kind of other countries, especially like in Europe or or in, in the Americas. So would that uh, would that affect the one the maintenance of uh, of the building and the, and their quality and the deterioration basically of, of this building in, in a much faster time. Uh, to a certain yeah, degree, I mean, I'll, I'll just go ahead, Ramzi, sorry. Yeah, so to a certain degree, yes. But so that's also where it comes back to not all real estate is equal, just like not all companies in the stock market are equal, not all stocks are equal, not all bonds are equal. So it very much depends. So yes, we talked about location, but it's also the quality of the build and then the value for the money you're getting. So if, so if you're... 10 years old is not really old in general in the real estate market. Maybe in UE it is considered old, but you need to also remember that the market here is continuing to evolve and it's still quite young. So now as we mature, you're going to probably see higher quality builds coming on board. And that's not to say that there are no high quality builds already existing. So it all comes down to value for money, um, location, quality of the build. And if you're willing and able to spend that um, to get that. So it's, uh, it's, it's all kind of tied and related. And that's where, that's why we talk about the, so the maintenance cost is also something that's, that's uh, important. And so it's not just the service fees that you pay. It's what's, what are those service fees actually being used for? And that's where the homeowners association also comes in. So you need to do your diligence before buying a physical property, whether it's your primary home or not, um, to make sure that that building or that villa community or whatever it is, uh, people, the other investors or the other homeowners are paying their dues on time. The homeowners association is making sure that those dues are being spent on the things to maintain the quality, to maintain uh, the, the build. Uh, and then just like real estate anywhere else in the world, you need to reinvest in part of it uh, on a regular basis, right? So you need to make sure that the service elevators and replace elevators every now and then. You need to make sure that the external facade is right. You need to make sure that any, I don't know, the, the corrosion from the salt water or the humid air, uh, that's also being kind of repaired and replaced every now and then. And so it's making sure that the money is being spent in the right way to, to see, to basically make sure that that is the right place for you. And so it's not always easy to do that um, if you don't, if you're not really an expert in it. There's something I also want to, add to that Ramsey, which is fantastic that, that the land department did is up until last year if i'm not mistaken or the beginning of this year uh, the homeowners association was with the developers um, so all the management all the uh, uh, service fees were controlled by the developers um, recently they've taken it away and they've given it back to the homeowners uh, who control and choose who will maintain that building who will maintain the apartments the common areas and I think that was a fantastic move. If you look at some of the buildings, actually, the service charge dropped when they were doing that. So to so the person who asked that question, um, you know, I would look into who the homeowners association is in that building, uh, because right now it's been transferred away from whoever was running it before to the actual the investors or the owners of, of those properties. So, um, and, you know, the excuse that the building is old, please don't accept that. Um, and I actually think this is where it's very important that before you do actually buy a home, you need to buy from a reputable developer. I mean, I can take you to, to buildings that have been built by, you know, Amar, uh, 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 Nahil, Dubai Properties, Miraz, uh, especially with Amar that are, you know, over 10 years old, uh, 15 years old, and they're actually in amazing condition. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, that's, that, you, know, you really need to make sure that you're buying with a reputable developer. But please, if you are living in a building that they're giving you that excuse, go after and find out uh, who, who the, uh, uh, homeowners association is and ensure that it's with the homeowners and raise your complaint. Thanks. Thanks, Rami. All right. We still have three more questions uh, in five minutes. So maybe let's start. Uh, so should I, should I buy my primary home in the UAE? Is it worth it? Should I lose my job and have to leave? So what's your opinion on this? So for me, it comes back to your risk tolerance. So if you think that you are, your job is at risk and you're going to be forced to move. Um, that's a personal decision. It, that alone shouldn't determine if you don't buy, because even if you leave, uh, you can still rent it out. Uh, and you just need to make sure that the rent is able to cover the mortgage 
and uh, the other costs of it. So uh, it, it comes back down to a personal choice uh, at the end of the day, provided the math makes sense. Same here, I agree. If you see uh, UAE as a home uh, over the next five years, then definitely it's a place to, to, to buy. Um, and by the way, actually, there, there's if you do lose your job, uh, they, they're changing the rules and they've changed the rules. They're giving people a lot more time than they used to before. Was if you lost your job, you have 30 days and everyone was worried and stressed, but what do I do? They've made uh, extending your visas and getting visas in, in the UAE a lot easier so that even if you do lose your job, um, in the unfortunate event that that happens, you have enough uh, you know, time to find another job and, and service the, the mortgage that, that you have on the house. All right. And so I think you kind of answered the next question about the overheated uh, market yeah. and a lot of hype. So um, don't. So I think it's the same thing in similar in real estate as it is to uh, to the stock market. It's hard to try to time the market, um, and so it depends also what your purpose is. So if your purpose is to live in it and to live in it for the long term, um, then it, it's it can still make sense. Obviously, you shouldn't overpay for a property, but then again, it comes down to location, value proposition, and then your, your personal situation. Absolutely. All right, one final question. So if I do have the money to buy a house in its entirety, is it preferred that I approach stake and split my money between two or, uh, or, or three houses instead? Diversification within real estate. So what do you think of this, uh, Rami? Uh, I mean, this, this, this question is music to my ears. Uh, it's, it's exactly what we preach. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, and Marwan, I think the person who asked the question, he, he doesn't work with us. So, you know, it, it's, he, <laughs> this is a, this is a, this, this is a great question because, you know, we, we believe in the main ethos behind our business is, you know, real estate is a fantastic investment, but, you know, investing in it, uh, is, is an annoying process. So we really think that, um, you know, how you invest in it and, and doing it via stake allows you to diversify. So I, I, if you're buying real estate as an investment, I don't see why it makes sense to put a million dirhams into one property. Um, you know, you're, you're locking up that capital into one apartment. There's a huge vacancy risk. Um, you know, you're not, if, 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 if your tenant leaves, if the area is no longer popular, if, you know, God forbid anything happens, you've locked up that capital into one property. So, you know, our advice is, listen, if you do have a million dirhams or you have 10,000 dirhams or you have 20,000 or whatever the amount is, is diversify across different uh, uh, properties. And what we do is we always try to put properties in, on our platform that are in different locations um, that have, you know, that are rented, that allows the investors to make money from different locations with different incomes, you know, and ranging between four to 7%. Um, you know, eventually, part of our roadmap uh, is to start putting uh, international properties on our on our on our uh, uh, on, on the platform. Um, you know, one of our lead investors is a developer in the United States. Another investor is, is a developer in the UK. So, definitely, will allow people to diversify not just in Dubai but cross border and international. Yeah, and it's it's great you said that because diversification doesn't just mean diversification one asset class within one country. So that, that's whether you own one property or three properties in one place, that's still kind of, it is more diversified, yes, but it's still relatively concentrated. So you should, whatever your kind of decision or strategy is, um, depending on the size of your portfolio and the hassle that you're able and willing to go through, the more diversified, the better, yes. So absolutely invest in more than one property if you can. Um, and stake obviously allows you to be able to do that but also diversify, make sure you're diversified beyond just real estate. So you need equity exposure, you need bond exposure, you need commodity exposure. And the difference between uh, the, the proportions that you are investing in will very much depend on what your financial goal is and what your risk tolerance is. So the more time horizon you have, the more you should be invested in riskier assets. Again, provided it makes sense uh, for your profile and your risk tolerance. Uh, the shorter time horizon you have, the less you should be diversified in, or the less you should be invested in uh, riskier portfolios. And so you should, uh, assets, and the more you should be invested in something like bonds uh, or uh, like defensive real estate or, or other things. Um, and so that very, so that's something that you need to kind of monitor uh, and uh, adjust your portfolio over time as you approach retirement or whatever the goal is that, that you are investing for. Um, and also based on the economic situation that you are in. So just because what's happening today, um, you deploy your capital accordingly, 
in one or two years from now, that, that same allocation uh, won't necessarily have the same risk profile. And that's where uh, our investment framework at least kind of uh, re-optimizes your portfolio automatically to make sure that you're always at the optimum uh, risk, at the optimum potential returns at that risk level. Uh, and so, of course, real estate is a super important part of that, but uh, diversification globally and across asset classes is extremely important, especially when you're looking at this for investment purposes, not just uh, end user or uh, uh, primary one. Thank you so much, uh, Ramzi, for this. And, uh, and with that, uh, that's the last question that we, we have for today. So I really want to thank both of you for, for your time. We would like also to thank, to thank all of our viewers since it's a show. So not the attendees. Uh, <laughs> for, for, we should do this in front, of a live, in front of a live audience next time. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, 100%. I, I, I really enjoyed this. I, I enjoyed your show. Uh, it's great. <laughs> Thanks, Rami. Thanks a lot, Joseph. We're more than happy to have you back on the show uh, next time. Thanks, uh, but 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 as I said, we're doing this every single month. Uh, every month, at the beginning of every month, we're bringing a leader in the industry to to discuss multiple topics uh, related to their industry specifically, and we'll be announcing the lineup very very shortly. So uh, again, thanks for both of your time. Thanks for for, for everybody who who tuned in. And uh, we'll catch up uh, next week for our the next Dashway Academy webinar. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Joseph. Appreciate it. And then just a note to all Thanks the audience. Um, if you guys do have any other questions that you want to ask, of course, you can reach out to either Stashway or uh, Stake on our support channels, whether it's WhatsApp, email, or a phone call. Uh, just yeah. visit our respective websites or, or the applications, and then you can uh, uh, get in touch with us directly. There is one more question. Or visit our office. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Also, Actually, one more person said, any promotion for people who attended today? Uh, yes, please do uh, reach out to us. I'm more than happy to give you a promo code, at least from the Stashaway side. Rami, would you be happy to give anything from the stake side? Uh, a hundred percent. Yes, 100%. Right. Reach out and we will uh, accommodate for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Rami, for, for your kindness. And thanks a lot for, for everybody to tune in. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.